Medicine saw a remarkable development from the Renaissance to the end of the 1600s. Humanists like François Rabelais took an increased interest in the human body. The principles of antiquity were put into question, and empiricism made a new research method. However, most medicine was still based on the knowledge of ancient physicians. The foundational principle was the concept of the four elements. According to this theory, the world consisted of four elements. Fire, earth, air and water. Their qualities, heat, cold, dryness and humidity, made up all materia. According to humorism, the body consisted of four liquids that mirrored the elements, their qualities and different personality traits. Take a look at this table for reference. Blood carried the qualities of air, heat and humidity. It was related to childhood and its chief temperament was sanguinity, meaning enthusiasm and activity. An individual with a surplus of blood was very social and joyful. Yellow bile carried the qualities of fire, heat and dryness. It was associated with youth and choleric behavior. Black bile carried the qualities of earth, cold and dryness. It was associated with adulthood and individuals with a surplus of black bile were believed to be more emotional and introverted. Finally, phlegm carried the qualities of water, cold and humidity. It was, of course, the humor of old age. A surplus of phlegm made you slow and inert. The key to good health was balancing your humors. This was done through diet, which back then had a broader meaning than just what you eat. Humans needed to consider six non-natural or external things to preserve their health. That was the air around them, food and drink, sleep, bodily expulsions, including the sexual ones, rest and exercise, and their emotions. A doctor's most important method of diagnosis was analyzing urine. They studied the consistency and color of urine, using a chart based on the theory of humorism. Urine could have the colors of yellow, white, red and black, each corresponding to the different humors. If the urine was reddish, the patient had problems with digestion. Green or purple urine was a sign of imminent death. So based on your urine, the doctor could decide which humors you had a surplus of. Bloodletting was a very common method of balancing your humors, and sometimes it was self-induced. For example, the buccaneer William Dampier tried to draw his own blood with a pencil, but it wasn't sharp enough. Other methods included feeding you laxatives or making you vomit. On the opposite, if you say, lacked black bile in your system, the doctor could prescribe you a nutrient that accomplished heat and humidity, thus restoring your balance. These were often based on visuals and taste. For example, saffron was said to cure jaundice, and the liver-shaped leaf of the liver leaf could cure, guess what, the liver. Different theories arose what caused illness. Diseases had constitution, meaning what territories they were likelier to exist in. Malaria was common in swamps and the flux during summer. Since we didn't know about bacteria back then, it was believed that sickness was primarily airborne. This is called miasma theory. Sickness spread through foul stink and such. This could be countered with other smells. This is why plague doctors carried fine perfumes in their masks, or why people burned sheets and started fires in houses that had been struck by the plague. Some also believe that disease was caused by certain substances spread through bodily contact. This theory was called contagium, and was believed to be the reason behind diseases such as syphilis. Interestingly enough, neither of these theories were entirely false. They just didn't have the technology to properly understand the causes. During the Renaissance, some physicians began to question the ancients, Andreas Vesalius said that it was obvious that neither Hippocrates nor Galenos had ever desiccated a human corpse. Vesalius himself became a field surgeon and conducted experiments on corpses. Francis Bacon preached a mythology of empiricism, as in, knowledge comes from sensory experience. René Descartes said that the body and soul were entirely separate. Harvey published modern theories on blood circulation, etc., etc., However, none of these scholars would have significant impact on the contemporary field of science. During the 1600s, most European countries made a distinction between physicians, barber surgeons and apothecarians. The main duty of the apothecarian was to purchase, prepare and sell medicine in his apothecary. He was also supposed to give assistance during the preparation of medicaments. In 1617, the King of England gave them permission to form their own organization the Worshipful Society 
of apothecaries. Who was the 1600s apothecarian? He dressed in a velvet suit and a full-bottomed wig. For the most part, he would find him advertising his apothecary in the local coffee house, leaving his apprentices to actually run the apothecary itself. Whilst the apothecarian was a haughty creature, all full of himself, the proper physicians looked down on him. After all, they had a longer education. In London, the physicians argued that apothecaries were entirely unqualified to sell their medicines. The name of the apothecary varied between countries. In Catholic nations, the apothecaries were named after saints. After the Reformation in Sweden, it was common to name them after animals. This remains a tradition today. This modern apothecary is named the swan, for example. Animals were often used to advertise the exotic products sold inside. Live snakes were kept in large jars outside the apothecary. You'd always find a stuffed crocodile hanging from the roof. This even appeared in Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet. The medicine cabinets were decorated with unicorn horns, actually narwhal horns, and the teeth of sawfish. The shelves were lined with jars, flasks and bottles of strange concoctions that were just as likely to kill you as they were to just let nature run its course. There were the traditional salves, syrups, electuaries, roots, oils and plasters. They sold medicaments, spices and sweetmeats to the burghers, craftsmen and the royal court. Larger apothecaries were lively places where apprentices climbed up ladders to collect wooden jars from the tall shelves whilst his colleague mixed herbs in stone mortars. The apothecary did his work at the receptum, containing a scale and ancient medicinal weights, libra, uns, drachma, scrupel and gran. He used alchemical and arcane-looking equipment to produce pharmacy using sulfur, antimony and mercury. Barber surgeons from the king's navy would come to the apothecary to fill his chest with important medicines for their voyage. This was a time-consuming and expensive process, both for the apothecaries, ship surgeon and admiralty. One Swedish surgeon needed eight sailors and two weeks to acquire the necessary spices and medicines for his chest. Though every ship of the time had a surgeon aboard, not everyone had the ship's apothecary. One was aboard the flagship Crown when it went under in 1676. The apothecarian had a lot of literature at his disposal. During the Middle Ages, most medical books had been written in Latin and intended only for physicians. Starting in the 1500s, medical books were written in local tongues and even translated. One book on the plague written by a Swedish bishop was later translated into English, for example. By the 1600s, medical books contained advice on health and diet for a wider audience than just doctors. The Bohemian physician, Johann Kopp, published in 1628 his almanac, containing plausible dates for bloodletting, pocking, bathing and other necessary things. Almanacs were even used by the peasantry and recommended dates for felling trees and sowing. They were an early form of mass media. Pharmacopies were official medical books with technical instructions for apothecarians. The first English pharmacopy, the Pharmacopeia Londonensis, was first published in Latin in 1618. In these books, Medicines were divided based on their texture. These were syrups, water, pills, powders, plasters, and so on. Ingredients, mixtures, and weights were provided, but no information on dosage. Neither were there any instructions on which diseases the medicine was actually supposed to cure. Traditional medicines were usually made from unrefined herbs, mixed with a lot of ingredients. The more modern medicines usually consisted of refined minerals, such as gold, mercury and vitriol. The universal cure-all of the 1600s was teriyaka. The name means curative against the bites of poisonous animals. It is an ancient medicine that was first developed by Emperor Nero's physicians, Democrates and Andromachus. They had been tasked to create a curative that could work as an antidote, but also cure diverse diseases. They decided to improve on the previous cure-all, called Mithridatium. Mithridatium had been created by Mithridates of Pontos, the poison king that had consumed so many small doses of poison that he became immune. The chief ingredient in teriyaka was snake meat, which was said to hold fantastical properties. That is why medicians praised teriyaka over Mithridatum. This persisted into the early modern era. Teriyaka was said to protect against animal bites, poisons, epilepsy, strokes, headaches, indigestion, dropsy, kidney stones and the plague. 
By the 1600s, teriyaki was produced in Italy, especially Venice. The ingredients were expensive and apothecaries would often sheet their way out, so official inspection had to be implemented in several countries. Still, sheeting remained common. Traveling quacks would sell knockoff teriyaki at outrageous prices. For example, John Woodall wrote about a Dutchman that sold fake mithridate with only nine ingredients. That might sound like a lot, before you realize that the original recipe for teriyaki contained 60 ingredients. Many of these were oriental spices, balsams and drugs. The reason it was so effective, however, was because it contained opium in the form of poppy juice. The powders and liquids were mixed with honey into an electuary, a sort of paste. This was fermented for at least half a year, producing a black color. It must have smelled pleasant thanks to the spices and honey, and was administered in water or wine. There were other miracle cures sold in the apothecary. Extract of licorice was dried and shaped into sticks or pills. It served as a weak laxative, could dissolve phlegm and impede bacteria. Today it is often used against coughing and ulcers. Castor is concentrated beaver urine, which the beaver extracts to mark its territory. It was used to cure toothaches and epilepsy. Now you might think, that stuff can't possibly be used for medicine today. And you're right. Instead it's used as a spice in vodka. (sighs) Copper oxide was used as a hemostatic and desiccating substance, meaning it was used to stop bleeding and to dry wounds. It was considered good against tonsils and polyps. Myrrh is a resin containing gum, hearts and oil. It was extracted from small, thorny trees in Africa and the Middle East. Its effects are actually unclear today, but during the 1600s it was used in tooth care and for balsaming the dead. Apothecarians faced a lot of competition from traveling salesmen and quacks. They would often get their ingredients from weird rural apothecaries, known as trekapotek in Swedish. That means shit apothecaries. These would sell stuff like toads, dog poop, earthworms and period blood. The quacks thrived in a market full of the constantly deceased and hypochondriac. They had no compunction in advertising and did so in newspapers, the walls of coffee houses, even the Royal Exchange in London. One such bill read as follows. Present remedy after misfortune. Or an immediate cure for the French disease and clap and all other of its numerous attendants, which oftentimes are the product of other grievous lasting distempers, to the utter ruin of many, besides frequently, unseely death, procured by them through grand abuses, committed by the base and irregular methods and medicines of foolish and unskillful pretenders. Good medicine and advice may be had of a physician of forty years' practice, living at the Blue Ball in Whalebone Court, the lower end of Bartholomew Lane, behind the Royal Exchange. Would you visit him? Tell me in the comments. The least reputable quacks were the traveling mountebanks, who sold their medicines from a portable stage in the street. They were usually accompanied by a monkey and a clown. The clown was nicknamed Mary Andrew after the physician of Henry VIII, who had needed a good sense of humor. The purpose of the clown and the monkey was to put the crowd in a good enough mood to buy the mountebanks' wares. These included bullshit such as a small pill that, quote, If you have 20 distempers, it shall give you 20 stools, and every time it operates, it carries off a distemper. Another was a plaster, which was apparently good against all green wounds, old fistulas and ulcers, pains and aches in either head, limbs or bowels, contusions, tumors of king's evil, sprains, fractures or dislocations, or any hurt whatsoever, received either by sword, cane or gunshot, knife, saw or hatchet, hammer, nail or tenterhook fire, blast, or gunpowder, etc. These examples of ridiculous quack medicines just go on and on. Remember that people today still buy ludicrous cure-alls, such as testosterone boosters and the like. The Montebank usually targeted the poor, described by Ned Ward as the brainless multitude. All too often they were too eager to open their purses to the Montebank. Just like today, people back then were hypochondriacs, terrified of death, and desperate to save their own lives against ghosts that weren't even present. If you enjoy the content I produce, consider supporting me monetarily on Patreon. You'll find the link in the video description. Otherwise, please give the video a like and a comment, 
so that YouTube will show it to more potential viewers. And why not share it with a friend? Cheers.